to fill her through this land of ours and fill the sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello, sportsmen. You stay tuned for the next half hour. We have an action-packed show covering a lot of subjects. We're going to take you fishing on Lake St. Clair for muskie, show you how unpredictable that can be. Speaking of unpredictability, we're going to take you turkey hunting, tips from Greg Appas, a Michigan World Turkey Calling Champ. He's going to teach us the one, two, three method turkey hunting, recipe, all kinds of things. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Young folks and a few old ones too will recognize these channel markers in Lake St. Clair. They're near Gull Island, a favorite party spot for boaters over the years. Lake St. Clair is also a favorite fishing hole for many people who fish for walleye, bass, muskie. Fishing has a mystique to it. It's not entirely predictable. Many lures and rigs have been developed to stimulate fish to bite. Here's one of Kirk Jaleski's favorites. It's called a Helan walleye combo a pair of lures behind a bell sinker. He says it's one of the best setups for all kinds of conditions. Uh, this area here, they seem to like the um, yellow belly and the white belly perch a lot. I think there's just a lot of schools and you can see a couple of perch boats out here in the area. And what we're trying to do is just mock whatever they're feeding on today. If you notice here, this combination I've got is a um, crackle frog and a white belly perch. I see that lure's been used slightly. Yeah, it's caught a few. It's caught a few. This is uh, this is probably my next favorite flavor here is the um, the crackle frog in a straight. So you always start out with the same combination? No, a lot of it has to do with uh, conditions. Right now, um, right now we're going to run with something a little bit more toned down as that sun comes up, and if it clears up, we're going to get into what we call a reverse crackle. Reverse crackle has a lot more yellow in it, and uh, what I'll try and do is take a look at what the sun's doing and how clear the sky is. If you notice, we've got a real white background. So we're going to run a lot of white bellies right now for the first couple hours, and we're going to switch back into some yellow bellies. Now, uh, what's your theory on that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, contrast. Um, if, you were to, uh, if you were to go to the bottom of a swimming pool and look up, you would see the, the sky as a background. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to fool, trying to fool a big fish. So we want a, a color, at least this is you know strictly my opinion, we want a color very similar to the background so that it doesn't stand out. We want the fish to see it but not get spooked and not get wise of it. And of course there's those days where you take all that theory and you just throw it all out the window. <laughs> Well, theories, that's one of the attractions of fishing, the fact that it's partly a science, partly an art, and partly something we don't totally understand. Sort of like Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolates. Well, fishing is like a box of chocolates, that's for sure. Okay. What do you think, Johnny? I think that's a small muskie. <laughs> Well, John Ford's muskie was one of the smaller chocolates, like a chocolate-covered cashew or a raisinette. Now, not that it's not a good fish or not that it doesn't represent an accomplishment, but it is small for a muskie, and Kirk Jaleski will try to get it back into the water as soon as possible. He does this without touching the fish if he can or touching it only until the hook comes free. Then that lure will be tossed out to add to the array of lures trailing behind the boat, and actually out to the sides of the boat, trailing behind the planer boards. Now, we know these lures are good enough to fool the fish. They fool the birds. Seagulls hover over the lures that are running just under the surface. They think they're fish. Just since we started talking about them. Is it running at all? No, not really. Eat. A couple quick jaws. Now he's just kind of thumping the head. Good head. It's a good-sized fish, too. I just seen him at the back of the... Out there. Oh, you did see him? Yeah. Yeah, you hit that. It's a real shallow, uh, real shallow setup. Unfortunately, I don't remember what bait that is. 
This is we're talking about getting into those waypoints, eh? Yeah. <laughs> well, John Ford grabbed the rod for the last fish. The etiquette of trolling like this says that anglers rotate each time a fish is hooked, so now it's Matt Radzalowski's turn. Musky rods are stout. There's not a lot of bend in them because they're built for power. You know, where they're hooked really depends on what kind of a bite they give you. Um, if you hook a musky right square on the tongue, he'll come in like a log. He's in, they're, they're in a lot of pain when that happens. If you get them in a lip, there's not much, there's not much um, sensitivity there, and they just go, they go like crazy. He's coming. coming in. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to try, try that little net. <laughs> well, without a big net, they bring the fish through the back door. I'm going to do open up this back door here. If it's a real big fish, you might just slide in it. Unfortunately, I took it off the boat. Well, actually, this is quite ironic. To land a big fish, you need a big net, but the net was left on another boat. All we have here is a 36-foot tiara with every electronic doodad imaginable, rods, reels, lures, but no net. Big boat, small boat, expensive boat, cheap boat, hey, it happens to everybody. But not every boat has a back door. Bring him right into the door here. Slide him right on him. See, you don't need a net if you have a back porch and a door on the back of your boat. This muskie was a decent one, but under 30 pounds, Kirk's policy is we turn it back, so that's where it will go. But not before it inflicts some pain on the fisherman. Yow! Kirk got hurt hooked on the wrist by the lure that was attached to the fish. Now, if that muskie decides to jump or flop around, it would be worse for Kirk. But fortunately, he got the hook out just in time. Good deal, Matt. So the first one. Hey, head first. Torpedo him in there? Torpedo him in. Well, Matt got nailed by that fish, too. He caught his finger on one of those sharp teeth. A little blood there got me a little bit, but hey. Well, nobody said that musky fishing didn't have its hazards. A flopping fish with a lure in its mouth, especially a lure with a multiple set of sharp treble hooks, is a hazard that can inflict a deep and nasty puncture wound on the fisherman's body. Kirk Jaleski knows the hazards of musky fishing and of navigating on Lake St. Clair, which can get rough on a moment's notice, but he likes the challenge. He likes the edge, the theories, and the science, and the luck. The unpredictability of relaxing on a summer day with lures in the water, not knowing at which moment a muskie might decide to strike. Muskies are fun because they're fierce, they're big, they're mean. Lake St. Clair has a lot of muskies because fishermen like Kirk and clubs like the Michigan Ontario Muskie Club promote catch and release. The muskies we caught went back. Maybe you will catch one of them this summer. All you gotta do is get out there and try it. We've got to get out there and try that again. Absolutely. I don't want to fish with you, though, because you got the big one, and, yeah, but that and Matt took the other big one from me. It's so unpredictable, that can switch around. That's totally. right, whoever grabs a rod, really. Okay, so muskie season, pike and walleye open today. That's right, today, Statewide the 15th. Inland waters. Lake St. Clair muskie? First weekend in June, Saturday. Okay, and what about your turkey permit? May 20th. And you're going to be out there with Brent Detmers, mm -hmm. with his camera. His That's right. Digital his, camera. His Sony digital camera. That's right, and he... Got some great tape with Greg Abbas. Let's check out the continued story on turkey tips. This here looks like prime roosting area. Has everything they need. You have a nice little opening here. Gives them room to fly up to that roost. You've got nice tall trees. You have oak, maple. Turkey guide and championship turkey caller Greg Abbas gave us some tips last week on scouting for wild turkeys. One key is finding where they roost. In the early spring, they're easy to see. They'll gobble from the roost, but if you have a sharp eye, a 20-pound bird clutching onto a limb is not that difficult to spot. At the crack of dawn, they'll fly down from the roost, and that's when the turkey hunting begins. It's not regarded as ethical to shoot turkeys on the roost. Now, once I found that roost site, one of my favorite ways to set up is to look for a large tree, one that's large enough to bake, break your outline, and most of these trees here will do. Now, we're on a trail here, and I know they are, they are following this trail every day, so I'm going to put a, a decoy out approximately 
15 to 20 yards from my position. I'm going to intercept them birds coming by. Hopefully we'll get a big old tom strutting around this decoy here. I'm going to look for that tree to break my outline. There's a nice big old tree here. I still like the comforts of home, so I'm going to cut this padding loose and give me a, a nice cushion here. Now I like to set up, I'm right handed, I like to set up with my left shoulder facing where I think them birds are going to come from. Because if they surprise me and come off one of my flanks, I'm still able to swing my gun all the way to the right and all the way to the left. If you have your back up against the tree, I can't swing my arm any further to the right. I'd have to move my whole body and he will see you. Now that I've got this set up here, I could get into my calling and hopefully call that bird up to that decoy and give me a decent chance at him. Well, this is a box call. This has been on the market for a hundred years. I consider this a long range caller. I like to use it on windy and rainy days. On a rainy day, I'll put it inside a bread baggie or Ziploc to give it a raincoat. Now to use this, you just move the striker. One side of this call will give you a higher pitch of a young hen and the other side will give you a raspy old boss hen. A little deeper sound, just so you have a couple different sounds to throw at the gobbler, maybe sound like two different hens. This call produces nice yelps and that's an I love you type sound to the gobbler. You're telling him, I love you. Let's go out on a date. And 90% of the time you're going to use that yelp. Now this will also produce all the calls of the wild turkey. This is a push button call here. Now this one hasn't been on the market all that long and you'll see some with rubber bands, some with springs in them. I prefer the ones with pins inside. The one with a pin makes it adjustable and I believe it to be more of a true sounding call. Now this is by far the easiest one to use and it don't matter what your skill level is, I, I really recommend a push button call. All you do is just push the button like the name suggests. Don't get any easier than that. It produces nice yelps, feeding purrs, that's the sound they make when they're feeding, and it makes nice clucks. This really cuts down the movement. I, I suggest this one to beginners and pros alike. It's a really good call to have. Next we have uh, three different varieties of uh, what we would call a slate call. We have aluminum, slate, and glass. The latest rage is a aluminum call and I love an aluminum call. It's just a little higher pitch and sometimes it drives that old gobbler crazy. Now to use this you just make little circles. And then to do clucks you just pull the peg toward you. It does beautiful purrs. Now that cluck is a where are you type sound. That's if that gobbler's held up on you 60 yards out. I like to give him a cluck and say, hey, I'm over here, where are you? The next call we have here is a diaphragm call. Now, to the beginner, I, I really strongly recommend you start off on a single reed. It's the easiest one to blow. And to use it, you just put it in your mouth and you say the word chick. That's how you get the sound on this. To clock on this call, you're going to say the word pick. These do really good cuts and cackles. And uh, the cutting of a hen is... Uh, very significant. It's a really excited call of a hen turkey and that's telling that gobbler, man I'm ready for you, get on over here right now. That really fires up the gobbler between the yelps and the cuts. The cutting sounds like this and I'm going to throw in some yelps in there.
lot of times that gets that old tom fired up. Now a cackle of a hen, uh, she basically does that when she flies out of the roost or across a creek. I don't consider it a mating call and I don't consider it a very significant call to master. If I had two sounds that I really want to master, it's a yelp and a cut. Uh, the purrs and clucks are nice when the birds are in close. Now how much do you call? That's often asked of me. And each gobbler is different. Sometimes uh, he needs a lot, sometimes he needs softer. Now, as he's getting closer, as a general rule, I like to cut my calling down and I like to make it a little softer. I don't call as much. When he's out in the distance, I really want to fire up that time. I want to convince him that he's going to come in. Here's an actual hunting setup. Greg Abbas is the guide on the left. There's a 13-year-old boy in front of him next to the tree and the 13-year-old's uncle on the right. And Greg has called in two gobblers. They're making their entrance from the left. Now this is excitement. It's tension. What will the birds do? How are two hunters gonna both get shots or will only one be able to shoot? Greg Abbas was whispering to both hunters. The 13-year-old in front of him, who had never been hunting before, this was his first hunting experience. The uncle was listening on the right. Greg told them to shoot on the count of three, and he whispered, one, two. <laughs> Don't you just love it when a plan comes together? This plan worked to a T. Got a double. You have to cut these guys a little slack. They were sitting quietly for a long time, motionless, except for the pounding of their hearts. Now the pressure is off, and they unload their guns. I don't know if you caught her or not, but the bird saw us, and we had to shoot. I got it perfect. All right. What you just saw was only one part of a turkey hunt, the moment of truth, as it's called. There's a lot more to this experience, and Greg Abbas will be doing turkey seminars at the Practical Sportsman Fair in July in Brighton. He'll show you how to make a turkey hunting plan come together. But for 13-year-old Nathan Morris from Fenton and his uncle Rick Morris, they got to see this plan come together firsthand. Brett St. Pierre from Ypsilanti was a cook-off winner a few years ago with his turkey cordon bleu recipe. You cut a turkey breast into two pieces and pound with a meat hammer until each piece is, oh, a quarter to a half inch thick. Lay a slice of ham and a slice of Swiss cheese over each piece of turkey. Roll them up and secure with toothpicks. Then rinse them in water, roll them in flour, and brown in butter for about 10 minutes. Then you put the brown turkey rolls in a baking dish. Bake these at 300 degrees for 35 minutes or so. Now, while they're cooking, melt cheese whiz and cream cheese in a saucepan. When the cheese melts, add some sour cream, reduce the heat. When the breasts are done, serve covered with this cheese sauce. Oh, my. We'll send you Brett St. Pierre's award-winning recipe. Our address is coming up at the end of the show. And this is Patricia Weber from Celine. Yes, and we're not near any big water, but we fish out of Manistee. Ah, very good. Yeah. Why Manistee? Well, probably the best fishing uh, starts there and runs north, so generally we do most of our fishing out of Manistee. The boats slip there. Oh, okay. So you got it on weekends. Oh, yeah. We're weekend warriors, and we're up every weekend fishing. And what is, you got this in April. Yeah, so April 20th. So you early. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Brown's my favorite fish. So. Why? Why? Good flavor. Very, very tender, very mild flavor. They're oily. Oh, no, no. No? No, you soak them in milk first. You do? Yes. Soak skin them, in... them? Or what? Well, you can, but, but generally. Leave the skin on? Yeah, leave the skin on, soak them in milk uh, to poach them, and then uh, fix them with your favorite recipe, whatever that is. Is that right? Yeah. And this is your favorite fish. Did you eat this Abs one? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, the taxidermist was really very kind, skinned the fish, and uh, gave us the meat back. Last question. Are the big ones better than the small ones, or small ones better than the big ones? Actually, I like the small ones better. Yeah. Yeah. But what the heck, if you have to eat this, you have hey. to eat it. Right? <laughs> yes. Well, congratulations, yes. Patricia Weber from Celine.
What you're looking at here is a cute little ferret. Now, I know it has the, the mask across the eyes, makes it look like the black-footed ferret that you read about out on the Western Plains, but these are domestic ferrets. These are our practical sportsman ferrets that Mickey Wingate and the Ferret Association provided to us a couple years ago, and we've had a lot of fun with these little critters, and a lot of people have in the country. Sal Ghani, um, you being an attorney representing a ferret owner right now in a I guess a bite case, a scratch case? There was a scratch case, Fred, and the county immediately upon uh, learning of the scratch went and confiscated the ferret and they indicated they were going to kill it. They indicate that the state has a policy which they kill and test. They have to cut the head off and test it for rabies. But that's not the law. The law says that they can quarantine it and do a risk analysis to determine whether or not the ferret could possibly expose a person to rabies. In this case, there's no chance the ferret could have exposed a person. Nonetheless, the county wants to follow the state policy and just kill and test. Our lawsuit indicates that they should follow the law, not the county policy, and basically do risk analysis. And we're currently in the Court of Appeals. They've issued a stay of execution of the ferret, and we're going to go back to court and hopefully have full hearings. Now, that's you may have read about this in the newspapers, seen it on television, uh, maybe even Sal involved with this. There have been protests. Uh, with a cat or a dog that even bites somebody and punctures them, they're quarantined, which that's the risk analysis? Yes. Okay, how often does this, this happen with cats and dogs every year? Um, in the tens of thousands of times. Um, unfortunately, in ferrets, there's been no report since 1956 of a ferret transmitting rabies to a human being. There's only been, I think, 20 cases reported in the last 30, 35 years, yet there's been um, hundreds of thousands of cases reported in cats and dogs. And our position is that the, rabies, the uh, ferrets don't pose any really risk to uh, transmitting rabies to a human being. Hmm. So this is something because ferrets are newly legalized in Michigan within the past few years. There has been controversy about the health aspects, the vaccination and so on. And our practical attorney, Sal Ghani, is right in the middle of this. Oh, we ought to introduce who you are. This is the keeper of the ferrets <laughs> at Practical Sportsman. Uh, Joanne Cribley, who also 